Hey, After Buzz TV watchers, on this Spotlight On, we're getting up close and personal with French radio show host Simon Marcel Badentail. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. There you go, a little look of love to kick us in here. Set the mood. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to Afterbuzz TV Spotlight on the show that gets up close and personal with some of your favorite people here in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Frank Moran. You can follow me on Twitter at Happy Go Jackie. Now, my guest today here, uh, he speaks the language of love. Look at that. <laughs> Originally from France, he calls the U.S. home for over 20 years. Now, in 2007, he decided to make a bold move in his professional career that you know, changed everything. He went into a radio station and said, hey, give me a radio show, give me my own radio show, even though he'd never had one before. Now, look at that. He is the first nationally syndicated French radio show host here in the United States. His show, The Rendezvous with Simon and Kim, now airs five nights a week, and they talk about love and relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome radio show host, nationally syndicated French radio show star, Simon Marcel Badentail. <laughs> look at that. How are you, sir? Bonjour, Franck. Oh, bonjour, bonjour my someone. Bonjour, bonjour. Franck. My, we'll, we'll learn quickly through this episode that my, my French is terrible. Your French is terrible, but, <laughs> but merci de m'avoir. Thanks for having me. Oh, the pleasure is yeah, all mine. Bonjour, Franck. No, no, it's, it's uh, you know, you said something interesting. It's true. You know, in America, and, and, and I came from France as an immigrant and all this, as I was telling you earlier, of hair, you know, anything can happen, even to a French dude like me, because... And it's a true story. I, I lived in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And one day, one day in 07, I was listening to the talk radio WTAM 1100, which was a clear channel station. That was before our heart media took over. And I was so upset with what I was listening to. And so I said, I got to call the program director and I need to make my voice heard, which is pretty arrogant, you would say, of somebody like me. But I said, what, what the heck? This is America. Yeah. And knocked on the door of a guy, the program director was Kevin Metheny who was made fun by Howard Stern so many times of pig vomit and so many things. That guy is in Cleveland running the stations of all the Midwest for Clear Channel. And, and he also put Glenn Beck on air and many others. Anyway, I met Kevin for two hours and he said, Frenchie, what do you want? I said, I want to, you know, um, have a show there on WTM 1100, which is the big 50,000 watt station in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And he said, but have you done that before? I said, never. But I said, who has done anything like this before? And he said, that's right. You have to start somewhere. And then that's why I said only in America. He looked at me, he said, Frenchie, I give you two shows, November 3rd, November 10th. This is your audition. We keep you, or we give you the boot. Bonne chance. <laughs> Kevin is dead today. And there is not, he died of a heart attack two yeah. years ago. I owe him, and I repeat that, where I am today. And it would be too easy to forget that if it was not for him, who said to me, I'm either too crazy or too stupid to put you on air, none of my adventure in America would have happened, and I would not be the first Frenchman syndicated on more than 20 stations. So I didn't want to forget, Kevin, when we started this segment with you, because without you, Kevin, where would I be? Now, as you're sitting there listening to this, this show that day that you decided to make a choice and, and call and get, try to get your own radio show, yes. what was it? was it? Was it just a particular host? Was it just the content of the show? What was it that just finally infuriated you so much? Well, you said, listen, like, I got to do it. I got to be honest. It was Rush Limbaugh who was going crazy, and, and I'm not so much on Rush's side, <laughs> and so that was too much for me. And so there's come a point where, and I love the freedom of speech in America, where you can't take it. You just, and that's why talk radio is fantastic. Or what we're doing here, because everybody has a right of an opinion, even a French dude like me. And that was before I became an American citizen. And, and I was doing news talk show, politics. And um, I remember, and the ratings went up, and I'll tell you the story. The first show I did, the people in Ohio were so upset that on their right-wing station came a liberal French dude like me. They called and they said, F Simon. And I said, if you, if you say F Simon, I'm going to play the French anthem, La Marseillaise, for you for three minutes, which I did. <laughs> and they said, we can't take the French anthem on the American radio. I said, don't insult me, just talk to me. The people in Ohio did wonderful and the ratings went up. And the same Kevin Metheny brought me to Chicago on WGN, which was a bold move in 09. And, I did, and, and, and over there, and then I got fired. <laughs> Frank, I got, I mean, Chicago, and I'm back on Chicago on Light FM now, but years ago, you know, you know Chicago. You've, yes. Right. So it's not Cleveland, and, and WGN is about whether the Cubs plays on WGN, <laughs> uh, whether good talk, not 
hard debate like I used to do for Clear Channel. So I got fired, and to the point of where we are now, uh, a woman called Alisa Polak from Our Heart Media and Jen Langmeier, who are running Premier, the syndication of uh, Our Heart Media, they said to me, listen, Simon, do not talk politics anymore. I said, why? Your accent is too thick. You cannot talk politics. You've got to talk about love. I said, love? Love, Simon. Talk to women at night. Talk softly. And we're going to make a show, The Rendezvous, but not to rendezvous politically. We rendezvous with you. And they brought my co-host, Kim Iverson, who was a very smart, beautiful, 30, at the time, 33 years years old from Boise, Idaho, was a great radio host, who was a great partner of mine in radio. And they said, now, Simon, bring the French romance, your point of view. She brings American realism. You bring French romanticism or romantic. And this is the show. And that's how Our Heart Radio took a bet with me. It was one station three years ago here. And um, ratings went up, two stations, three stations. You know, we got uh, Philadelphia, we got Chicago, we got Miami, we had Tampa, you know, and so on, Seattle. And and then I go back and I think Kevin Metheny, 2007, said yes. Now, Frank, how many men in your life have said yes to you and give you such a shot in your own career? No, I know that uh, very few. So, and, and whether that's me taking the initiative like yourself to go and ask for that shot, I think that's the biggest thing is that many people would want that opportunity. They think they could excel if they're given that opportunity, but you've got to have that courage to be able to sometimes ask for it. Well, my dad, Robert, said, who doesn't dare, doesn't live. Qui ne sait pas, n'a pas in French. And, and I was raised by parents who constantly dare. And there was no other way. I mean, listen, I didn't know if I had any chance of getting the, the gig or not. But I knew if I didn't ask, no one would ever give it to me. It's like on a date. I always say to that to guys. You know, guys call me at night on the rendezvous and said, Simon, you know, I really like this woman, but I don't know if she likes me back. All you got to do if you want to get out of the friend zone is to ask her out. I would like to take you on a date. She says, yes, you in? She says, no, she's not into you and be friends. Same with radio or what we do. All you got to do is ask. This is America. That's, that's what is huge. And I think just like also women have a right now to, to ask guys out, I think all of us could go to any woman or, you know, if, if, if you get for a guy or a partner and say, yeah, I want to take you out, whoever you like. Now, when they, they approach you, because you're doing more political commentary and talk when you first started. Uh, yeah. When they said, like, hey, we want you to do more, you know, focus on romance, focus on love, focus on relationships. For you, was that like, was that an easy switch to make? Or were you like, oh, wait a second, I've never really thought about pursuing it from that direction? It was, Frank, I'll be honest, I was shocked. I was upset nobody cared about my political views. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like such a schmuck. I said, really? All the, all for nothing? And, and then the people at Our Heart Media said, say, you know, say ooh la la. They would say that to me, say, say ooh la la. I said, no, because they said, what do you say when you make love and you have such a good time? The French people say ooh la la. Right? That's what we do. Americans don't say ooh la la. He said, well, right, what do you say? Well, let me <laughs> no, ask you this, wait, Frank. Wait, when do you say ooh la la during when, the course of this? When it's really good. Wait, during the act, during yeah. the course of it. You... Ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> and, really? And, yeah. So, <laughs> All right. So it started like this. I remember yeah. it was Alisa Polak. You know, we were having coffee in, in New York. And she said, what, what do French people say when it's really good when you make love? And I said, ooh la la. Now, Frank, what do you say when you're making love to... What do you say when it's really good? I, I, I think it's more like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. like, thank, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Okay. So, so when I said ooh la la, I remember the, the ladies at Premier said, ooh la la, yeah, ooh la la on air. You know, and anyway, also, you know, she, they said that, and I totally get it. I sound like a foreigner, even though I have a blue passport. I showed you, Frank, earlier, mm -hmm. so it's official. <laughs> I am an official American citizen and proud of it. But when I speak, it sounds French. Now, it's it's great for a love show. I think politically it hurt me. Um, nobody wants to hear from a foreigner what to do when it comes to politics. So... I shut my big mouth politically once and for all, and then I went, and I really what I did, and I'm so grateful to Our Heart Media for that, is I listened to women at night. I mean, the, the, the rendezvous, people call us. We don't call people. They call us to talk about what's going on in their life or give a comment or chime in. And my job is to bring anybody calling us an argument to have a better, a, a better love life. Now, let's go back to the beginning real quick, Simon. Yeah. Uh, what, what did initially bring you over from France to the U.S.? Well, two things. Um, a job 
in Cleveland because uh, my company won a contract to billboards and advertising with the city of Cleveland. At the time, it was Mike White who was the mayor there. And then also, um, uh, I, had, I have my goddaughter who was, was, was uh, in, in Cleveland, and her mom is a dear friend of mine. So I had a little bit of my goddaughter, you know, uh, some, a little link. But without the job, none of this would have ever happened. So I won the contract with the city of Cleveland to do this, this billboard program out of home. And that's how I moved in in 98. And let me tell you this, Frank, you from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I challenge anybody from Europe, at least France or Italy and Spain, who are not used to the winter. <laughs> and I arrived in Cleveland, Ohio, January 1st, 1998, put my, 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 my two suitcases in some Holiday Inn hotel, looked by the window, and I said, ooh la la. And it was not the same kind of ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. So it took a while, but I tell you what, you from the Midwest, you'll understand. In America, the Midwest, I think, has one of the nicest real people I've ever had the chance to, 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 to meet and to live with or to date. And they were very welcoming. And in the spring, the party started. So, yes, three months, very hard. And after that, la vie belle. Life is beautiful. <laughs> So your company wins a contract, and you're living there, and you're working. Yeah. At what point do you realize, like, you know, I would really just like to stay here. I don't want to really go back to France. I'd rather just stay here if it's possible. That's spring. That's that, that, just the party when everything thawed yeah, exactly. out. Exactly. Like, uh-uh. Uh, exactly. You know, three months, on, three months of winter, I told my brother, Benjamin, listen, send me a robe. I'm going to, you know, commit suicide in here. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know how it is. Yes. But spring and summer in Cleveland, Ohio, in Akron, and you and you meet all the people, and you go out all. I was single, and I go out and I have fun. And the American women are very nice, and so you know it was it was hard to resist. And then I met some other guys from the Cleveland Clinic, you know, from all over the place, and and I played ping pong like a crazy man, and and you know then I felt right at home. Bought my first house in Akron, and been there ever since almost. All right, so now you say you're going out, you're you're dating American women. Now, yeah. what do you think uh, the big difference between dating an Amer uh, uh, American woman and a, and a French woman? Exclusivity. Listen to this one, Frank. In France, the French women expect to be exclusive right after the first French kiss with the tongue. <laughs> oh, so as, as long as it's, there's no tongue involved, you can... Yes. Okay. The tongue makes the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but once you have French kissed a French woman, you're not authorized by the book of French dating to go date other women. In America, I don't know why. American women have given men the right to do whatever they want until, until what, Frank? The talk. Yeah, yeah, until are we... Exclusive. A, yes. Are we in a relationship? What I would like to ask mostly to our American women viewers is, why did you let that happen? You gave all the American dudes the right to go with multiple women forever until you have the talk. And I feel like it's going almost... And my co-host, Kim Iverson, says, that's like going to a car lot. And you try this car and you try this car. If you said that to a French woman, just slap your face twice and back to your room. So that's the number one difference. Exclusivity starts at the first French kiss. Here you have to have a talk. Wow. And the second thing is, have you been to France? Once. Have you been to the south of France? Only, only to Paris. That's okay. I discover in America, chest, breast is a major taboo. There's a whole industry based on strip clubs based on looking at naked breast. Mm -hmm. Now, in France, naked breasts are a natural thing by every ocean and every beach there is. And so I was fascinated of why such a taboo around this and the body of American women, where the French women seem so much more at ease with nudity or half nudity and of no big deal whatsoever. So that was a big difference. After that, women are wonderful women everywhere, and it's exactly the same, and they expect the same from you. But exclusivity and the taboo of, of being half naked or naked and, and how to approach that is different. Uh, and also, maybe, you know, American women uh, have, I found them a very easygoing approach on a first date where I found French women sometimes to be too intense intellectually. You know, and they go for the juggle of the questions, you know, about your ex and all this. Like, that's another thing, Frank. I mean, right? In America, on the first date, I always say, don't ask all those questions about the ex or... It's too personal. Just get a feeling. Mm -hmm. do you, when you meet the person, do you feel comfortable or you, or you don't? Do you like her or do you like him? Do you, in France, they go intellectual deep on you. So that's the difference, I think. Now, how I, we, on a date, 
Like yeah. How fast? How fast? You usually pretty quickly you're going to figure out if you're interested in this person or not. You can know pretty quickly, don't you think? Or how, he, how fast did it take you? Oh uh, gosh, I, I would uh, within within a matter of minutes. I feel like this is somebody I'd like to spend more time with. Or if you know, it's like mm, all right, this is not working. But let's be 100% honest, Frank. Okay. If you go on a date, yes. You look at the woman in front of you, mm -hmm. right? You said a few minutes you find her maybe attractive or you find her interesting. That's true. You find her attractive, and the more you talk to her, she's going to get more interesting. Okay. Now, if she's attractive, Frank, but not that interesting, will you still try to make love to her at the end or be honest? You're not. I have to be honest. It would, as much as I'd like to say, oh, hey, hey, yeah. But no, it, it, the interest wasn't there. It would just be tough uh, for me to want to pursue that. For something that I knew just in my heart, I really, really wasn't that interested in. Now, if we had two glasses of French red wine or champagne, is your answer going to change if, if everybody's having a little buzz? Oh, of course. I think every, right? everybody that's buzzed. Right? Everybody, yeah. That's why I said and the French are the king and queens of wine, as you know, and champagne. But the, the effect of alcohol on dating is huge. I always say, if you can have a cafe or a tea for the first date and you still like the person afterwards, you're really in good shape. <laughs> Instead of going to dinner drinking wine or vodka or whatever you like and then you say I like the person but you're not even aware of what's going on anymore you know what I mean Frank yeah. you gotta be honest that's why I said you should people should date in a cafe at first have, have a cafe at 4 and 5 in the afternoon and then you'll have a better idea <laughs> that's my tip so now well, you're, so you're here in Cleveland or in, uh, in Ohio and yeah. you're working and you go back and you say hey uh, you tell your family you know what I'm not coming back I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here I'll come back and visit, but I, I'd like, I want to stay here in the States. Was your family like, sure, go for it? Or like, why? Why do you want to stay there? Why don't you want to be with us? This discussion took place before I left because when I took the job, it was not a three, six months job. It was if we do it and we get the contract, you're staying for years. Um, listen, I owe everything I am to my parents, Elizabeth and Robert. Um, my joy of life, my sanity. Um, my faith, everything. So and my brother and sister, we're a close family. It was very difficult, very sad, but very exciting to do what my father said, because we're Jewish, and he said, when I was walking on Omaha Beach in Normandy, which is where the Americans on June 6, 44, came to save the French and the Jews. He said, listen, we owe everything, all of us, the Jews, to the American heroes who came. If you can in your life, Go west, young man, if you get my drift. So there was this proud moment of I'm going west, I'm going to become one of them, and and crying moments, especially my mother, who, who you know, Jewish mother, goes, you know, I'm losing my son to America. But my goddaughter was there, and, and her mom and all that. And friends. So it was a sad moment. It was a sad moment. But I know it, it certainly what your father said impacted you, because even on your first show, you may just uh, give thanks to all those veterans. that. that... You, know, you know, Frank, and, and I'll do it again now, all of us, and I mean all of us Jews to start with, and all of us French, without the heroes from 1944, we would all be burned in gas chamber by the Nazi. Period. We can never forget. I don't forget. Uh, and I'm constantly grateful to them. My father is, my cousin, my brother, we know the truth. If, and all the boys who lost their life on that, that day, June 64, 6, 1944. So... I really feel when I'm here free, talking to you, being on this show, it's a miracle. Because all of them who lost their life, lost their legs, who, you know, were shoot with, their, you know, with the parachute going down. So, yes, it's a huge thing. And when I carry my blue passport, it's the proudest moment of my life. I'm at the federal court downtown Cleveland, I remember, in 2010. There's about 90 of us from all over the world. The judge comes in, and you're going to stop you know, doing the swearing and all this. My heart beats, and I think about my father, and I think my grandfather who died in Auschwitz, and I think about how did I end up on that side of the world? You know, the Jews say it's mazel, it's luck, and that's what I believe. So that is an adventure in itself. Now, you gained that, that sort of words of wisdom and that outlook from your father. Now, what about your mother? What did you learn from your mother? How to love women. <laughs> All right, great mom. That is a I'm, great mom. I like to say this. If you have a good mother, and I've been fortunate to be very lucky with my mom, you learn how to love as an adult the way you are loved by your mom as a little boy. It's the most fair or unfair system, but that's the way it goes. 
And my mom has given me the sun in my heart. She has enlightened my heart for the rest of my life. Because the big blue eyes watching me always and said, don't worry, Simon, ne t'inquiète pas, je suis là, I'm here. And the holding and the smile, when she comes to see me in the States every year, it's true, and she's 72. And she waits for when I see her at the airport at uh, Kennedy. The smile on her face, and it touches my heart. And I'm sure your mom too. It's, so I am very fortunate to know that. Now, my mom is a famous, very famous feminist, very famous in France, like Simone de Beauvoir, and has tremendous work and, and respect for women and women's rights, and I've been educated like this. So everything I know, people say, how do you know so much from the show? My mom. My mom has taught me how women think, and my sister Judith, who's a shrink, has taught me how women feel. And then I've been listening to American women for almost 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so when they when uh, when iHeartRadio, or Clear Channel at the time, comes and says, we want you to kind of change course, go from political to more about love and relationships. For you, with that background, this, I mean, while it's kind of like, oh, you don't want to hear about my thoughts about politics, it, not not too scary a prospect to want to talk about those other subjects. You have such a ground, great knowledge. Uh, exactly, Frank. When uh, Alisa, let's name it, Alisa and Jen from Premiere and Our Heart Media then, indeed, uh, say, Simon, we want you to talk love. And they said, and, and don't talk sex. <laughs> I said, really? Yeah, I'm kidding. They said, you, anyway, so then they said, and listen, listen because you're a great listener. And I'm a great listener because my mom listened to me. I don't have to talk all the time and I've learned to listen. There is nothing more interesting in my show, in my opinion, than to listen either to the women calling me with a question about men or my co-host Kim Iverson giving me her point of view. It's magic to be in my shoes and to have the power of this microphone and the earphones and, and listen to what women have to say in the behind the anonymously a wall of radio. It's their real voice, their real story. It's just usually they're not their real first name, most of the time, right? And they call us from all over America with a question about usually a man or a partner if they like women. And we're here to help. I mean, what better job than to be paid to talk to women at night? <laughs> that, I don't know what better job for me. I, <laughs> I couldn't find one. <laughs> now, in your time doing the show, The Rendezvous, yes. what how what have you learned? How have your how have your opinion changed? Has anything changed during your time between when you started and now? Just having all these conversations, talking to so many women, people have called in throughout the years. Yeah, I mean, many many things have changed. I have learned the, the I don't know if it's English. The susceptibility is that English? The uh, yes, French susceptibility. It means the thin red line of which a man can talk about certain topics or not. Mm. Uh, my mother language is French. Your mother language is English. So you react emotionally to English words a certain way. I react emotionally to French words a certain way, American a different way. So I've been changing sometimes the way I explain something because American people are expecting, it's, it's totally normal, is something that reaches out to uh, the core of emotions. The other thing is, I didn't expect such politeness for my English mistakes. And I've learned that, because I've always told Kim, my co-host, I said, listen, you know, on the moment I make mistakes, you know, and, and she said, oh, don't worry about it. And, I, and that was a big fear of mine. So I've learned that you could just say what you want. And finally, shut up and listen. If I've learned one thing in all these years is to know when to stop to talk and listen to the caller. And then you get the core of the story or the matter. It, it's, that's with what I've learned. And if I can bring some joy of life, I'm for the joie de vivre. I've, <laughs> we've won every segment. But it's, it's a team. It's Kim and I. I mean, the show, you know, we're number one in Philadelphia. We're doing really good. It's not just me. It's me and Kim Iverson. It's, it's our heart radio. It's our producer, Jill. It's Adam. It's all this magic team, crazy motley crew of ours. And our heart radio who took a bet on us. And, and that's why only in America, Frank, because in <laughs> France, you don't have a shot. You, your accent, will never, ever have any show on any media, impossible. Really, just because of my accent alone? That's it. Even if I spoke fluent French, just because of my accent alone, it would not be? No, this is, this, this, this is why I'm happy you're probably here. I do not think, and the French are gonna hate me listening to this, but the same open mind welcoming for foreigners and their accent exists in France than in America, honestly.
because I, I remember when uh, was Bradley Cooper was doing some promotional uh, tour for a film that was coming out, whether it's A Team or something else. But he was on a on a over in France yeah. doing some uh, some television there, and he was doing he's fluent in French, so he's doing the yeah, whole. Yeah, they love it. Yes, and so like that, I was like, wow, that's cool. Now, like, so I would think like if you thought that was cool, wouldn't you want to? If somebody came over there and they could do that, you wouldn't want to see a show hosted by them. Well, Bradley Cooper has an advantage over all of us. He's so good looking. <laughs> he, I no, mean, listen, true. all true. the French women went, oh la la, when they <laughs> when they saw. Bradley Cooper talk, you know, so that that was like, but uh, and 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 that's one, you know, the sensitivity in America when it comes to love, sex, and relationships is super high. I don't know if you feel it, but there is a war of sex. Mm -hmm. There is a war of sex in America, and and the war is women feel objectized. Is that English? Ob yep. <laughs> what? Ob yeah, like you're an object. Mm -hmm. And and then also men feel you know that they they don't they are blamed right for not listening enough. I mean I hear that every single night. You know we're not an object. We're not just here for the making love pal. And guys go listen. You know I can't take it. I come in home and blah 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 blah. And 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 even if I say something, just shut up and listen. So I've seen that and that. Uh, between the illusion we, we almost promote in all the TV shows and all this of romance and the reality of being together for years, that's where there's, I think, a, a need for communication. And that's what we're here for, to ask questions. Now, what do you think, they, certainly as dating has continued on since you've started the show or just even been here in the States, uh, technology has advanced as well too. So do you feel, it, in terms of dating, has technology been a help or a hindrance in terms of dating? It's a tremendous help if you understand, it's no more than a modern love letter sent to you, which means don't idealize online dating, the person you see online. What I love about online dating is we can reach out to so many more potential dates. And I believe in true love, Frank. So I believe by opening the world, it's great. Now, a couple of mistakes. All the guys who are posting without shirts on, they're just here for hooks up. All the women who are showing too much cleavage, make the same mistake, you become an object. And the other thing I've learned listening is the quicker you go for coffee, the better. So online dating is nothing more than to have a chance to meet somebody. But the danger of this is the supermarket effect, which is, you know, Tinder. You, you swipe in, swipe mm -hmm. that. And what happens? The younger generation, you know, my late 40s, so I, I see the younger generation say, it doesn't matter, one more, one less, one more, one less. And that is the only difference. So I say, if you find one you like, don't multi-date. Think French one at a time, <laughs> one French kiss at a time, and 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 open up. But I think I think it's great to meet people. Just meet them. Just don't stay online forever. So because I I know I do know several friends that will meet somebody online and then it's a long back and forth. That's yes. wasted time. Just if you see some kind of initial interest, go for coffee right away. Just get to it. Uh, yeah, and not at night. I've always said, especially to the younger. Callers who says, you know, the guy just said, we just, you know, online, Tinder, meet me, and it's 10 o'clock at night. Don't do it. Wait the next day, go at 5 or 6 in the afternoon. And don't go close to where you live because we live in a dangerous world. Mm -hmm. And so we need to use online dating safely. And for that, it's simple. You know, you, you, you have coffee, you know, you know, far away so they don't know where you, li where you live, and I would not give my name anyway. And, and I don't know, do you, do you online date? I, I have not online date. You have not online date? No. Okay. Well, there's two things you have to be worried about. The lies goes on the age, and that's probably most of the guys, I think. The heights, short guys, I hear from women, are trying to appear taller, right? And then, and then the, the finance, there's some guys who apparently try to present themselves as wealthy men to attract women who are interested in that. But besides this, it's a fabulous tool. Yeah, but I just feel like, you know, maybe like the finance. Are you in a that, relationship? I am in a relationship. How did you meet her? Uh, blind date. A blind date. Blind Who set date. you up? Uh, f uh, a friend of mine from work and a friend of hers. They were actually uh, dating, and so they. So I love blind date. Wait a minute. B drive me through this. So you, yes. So w how nervous were you before? We talked a couple times, and the conversation went well on the phone. So I was like, "All right, yeah, let's do this." But you didn't know what she looked like. I don't. I don't know. I did not know what she looked like. I did not know what she looked like until I opened the door. So yeah. And then tell me how you felt. You open the door, and then you look, and you go. I was like, "Oh, all right, that was a good deal." Yeah. So, so you passed the first. She looks attractive. Yes. Yes. Right? And, and then she said that. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just watching General Hospital, which is a uh, soap yeah, opera. I know. Yes. And so I also happened to watch General Hospital. Didn't even know that. That's <laughs> something we never talked about before. I was like, "Whoa, all right." And so all right, that already there. There's the interest just drawing me in.
how long it took you before you had this first French kiss? Uh, I do remember the first, at the end of the first date, I, uh, as she will say, uh, that I, I gave her a kiss and then I ran away. I ran. What? I, was, I ran. Why? I, 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 I was so awkward. I was so awkward. I, I, you know. You gave her a French kiss and you ran I did, away? I did not give her a French kiss. It was a kiss and oh. then I ran away. So I think the first French kiss, <laughs> that was, that was terrible. Not very smooth. Uh, no. maybe, I would have imagined within the first three dates, I would imagine there was a French kiss. Okay. Be a hundred percent honest with me. Yeah. The three weeks, did you date anybody else? Did you go on any other date? Or you stayed to the course to yeah. that lovely lady? I stayed to the course, but let's be honest. I'm not a catch. So I mean, I'm just lucky no, to get one. No, you are a catch. I was lucky just to get one date. No, no, no. Yes. no don't be humble. No, no, you are a catch. You're great smile, great oh, hair. please, Good son. looking guy like you. <laughs> no, no, no. So so you, you no other date, right? No other date. Would you be upset if you knew now that during the three weeks you were not dating anybody else, she was dating other dudes? If I found out now, would I be mad? I, or would I guess, you be laughing? Uh, I well, she chose to be with me, so I think at the end I'd, I'd find that entertaining. I couldn't be mad at. I mean, I won in the sense, like she stuck with me. How long it took you to have the a we together talk? The, where I was, oh, uh, I was about to say it was the ooh la la, ooh la la. Oh, I have to do ooh la la. <laughs> I. Oh, you have to do it like this, ooh la la. Really? Not ooh la la. <laughs> it's not a high pitch ooh la la. <laughs> yeah. I, I, ooh la la. Yeah, that's better. All right. With the H, ooh la la. Ooh la la. That's, you know, when things are good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that at home. <laughs> that's, yeah. I feel like it'll be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, well, I, uh, between us now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, the, the, we had the talk. I think that that happened, I think that happened, may have happened after the ooh la la. Yeah. You you said something or you had the ulala and then you said are we exclusive or it was obvious. Uh I mean I I guess it was kind of I think it was obvious and then it was just one of those like wasn't like an in-depth kind of thing but it's just like oh yeah I guess you know we are we yeah are we together yeah we're together. Yeah. So you had to talk. Yeah, I guess it was, but it wasn't it didn't feel like it didn't feel like a like this is the talk but it just felt like Oh yeah, this is we're what's, just doing. What's this. her first name? Erica. Erica, you live with her now? I do. Yeah. How long it took you from that ooh la la and then to say we moving in? Man, that took forever. That. How long? Uh, that took, uh, two years. Two years. Yeah. What? What? Ha- two years? Of, why were you were you scared? Yeah, I, you know, just, I think like many guys, you know, every every guy just wants to just sit there and have their own kind of place. <laughs> I mean, even though you, you, I mean, it wasn't like I was dating around or anything like that, but you just wanted to have like your. You were not my, dating around. At that least. wasn't. So, but you still want to have your like. This is my place. I just want to have my place. Were you sad to give up your place? Uh, I think you're always worried about like what's the potential. If you move in with somebody, yeah, that's yeah. a huge step in a relationship. If it goes well, me moving's terrible. Simon, I hate moving more than anything in the entire <laughs> world. Agree. Moving's the worst thing ever. So if I'm moving and then if it goes bust yeah. and I have to move again, oh! Did you you move you move from to from your place to her place? We got a place. We got a new place together. So, oh, that's oh! You started fresh. Started fresh. Very smart. Yes. Yeah, so, but I hated that move because I had too much stuff. And then when we moved, we've moved again since then to another place, and I hated that move even more. Wow. Oh. Now, just off the record, you and yes. I, it, what's the things you could change about her? One thing, if you said Erica, I could change one thing about her, what would that be? Oh, well, like I'm going to say that now. Yeah, say it now. Oh, no Come way. On. Forget that. No, one thing. I, I knew who was watching this. <laughs> one thing. Give me one thing. We're going to be honest. I'm honest with yes. you. Yes. All right. I, I, uh, one thing. One thing. Uh, Erica. Erica, oh, it's for you. Oh, oh, Erica, this is for you. I, uh, oh god. One I, thing. You know, I, uh, one thing I would change about her if she was more of a night owl. No, that's that's you're not I'm saying not, the truth. I'm t- that, that, <laughs> you, okay, that okay. is the truth, I but it is not. Break. It is yeah, not. It's, <laughs> it's the bottom of the list. <laughs> it's about. It is the truth, but not at the okay, top. Okay, what do you think she would say about you? If we ask Erica right now, what she, what could Frank do better or change? What do you think she would say after all this time? Uh. I think she'd probably want to just. Uh, I yes. feel like I was. Uh, feel like I was in the whole time. Feel like I was fully. Yeah, I think two feet in. I even though I'm still here, I'm still. Yeah, that sounds so terrible. Even though I'm, I, I, we, yes, we're in this relationship. We've been together for uh, gosh, uh, long. We've had a kid. How long? Uh, you have a kid. Yeah. So uh, we have a we have a kid together. So I mean, but I'm always like, oh, I, I'm gonna be leaving any day now. That's it. I'm out of there. That's she's your like, thing. Yeah, she's like, ever since we've been together, that's all you've been talking about. It's like one foot out the door. So I think she'd just like to know, like, let's just. You it's know. like that foot that's like the the, yeah. the bachelor pad you had before. That's right. It's stop, the same. Yeah. Stop, stop having a foot out the door. Just be here. Just I be see. here and not worry about this. All right. Let me ask you this. Yes. What advice would you give to a guy who starts his a younger guy who starts his love life about women? 
Man. What would you say? One thing. Let's let's hear something. Man, Tom, you know, you, you ask me these questions, and I'm a t- I'm a terrible dater. I'm terrible in relationships. One thing you've I learned. Think, one thing I've learned would be, uh, you know, I I think you, what, I I just feel you have to treat women with respect. That's for sure. You can't treat them as just some kind of uh, object that you can be used and discarded. I mean, they're they have. Yeah, just I, I've always I've, I've grown so, up being respectful to women, so I feel like that is the way you should treat all everybody, but treat women with respect. I'll say this, and it's not politically correct, but I feel the young people need to listen to this. Making love is not pornography. There is too many times now I hear younger folks in their early twenties who have watched too much porn, who thinks that's what women want, and and do not remember the words make love. And really, please understand, and I've listened at night carefully now, that what you look in porn is not what women want, number one. I mean, really, I, mm-hmm. I think when I was younger, you couldn't see porn and of this. We've learned how to make love and discover women gradually, organically, not with no porn whatsoever. We, all we had was Playboy magazine. Remember that? Oh, yes. All right. Now, the younger generation look at porn. It changes the way they act and what they think women want. One. Two. No lying, no cheating. I told two young dudes in Chicago two weeks ago, guys in the 20s. I said, women love the truth, but don't be afraid of rejection. If you want just a hookup said, if, but tell them the truth. No lying, no cheating. Everything else is okay. But I really think that porn is not making love, no lying, and no cheating. And with that, I think you're in good shape to start to love somebody if you meet somebody. Uh, but I also think with women now that... <clears throat> Excuse me. With women, there always seems to be a double standard where it's all right for men to sleep around and be doing that, but that's still we still women are still dealing with that subject of like, wow, if I wanted to just you know enjoy having you know hookups with multiple guys, all of a sudden they're looked thought less of, and I, I feel like why do we still have that kind of hookup to uh, hang up? Because today? women are lying. The women do not want hookups. I don't believe it. Take away you don't the think al- so? no. Take, take away the alcohol, Frank, and it's impossible. There's no woman at five in the afternoon who is going to have coffee or tea, no alcohol, and look at a guy and say immediately, I want to make love, and ooh, la, la, with him? I don't believe that. Because women are built, ultimately, to have kids. Women have built for an extraordinary uh, uh, option to give life. The whole sense of purpose of dating is to find love, to make a family. There's no woman, whatever they say, I believe, that just want to hook up. I would, cause I mean, I think women have physical desires, physical totally. urges. Totally, yeah. with one guy, and in the purpose of nesting and building something together. Yes, the same, making love desire, hundred percent, not the porn. And finally, I really, I don't believe that. I, you know, and also, my co-host and I have this debate about. She's American, and she says American women fake the big O all the time, right? And us guys are suckers, and apparently we see nothing. We're all blind. Maybe so, <laughs> but I don't know. And, and the French women would say, if you suck, they stop. It's a very big difference. So if you suck in bed, there is no happy ending. Oh, you don't, so it's not like the, the, the guy gets his and the woman no, doesn't get hers. she her. stops making love to you. And that's it. And say, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> now, okay, so that's a cultural difference, which, but I love the honesty. Yeah, that, that tells you right now, you're not doing the job. Yeah, and, and, and then we talk about it. So I do think that, and I don't know if my co-host Kim is right or not, she claims she is, but I, first of all, I don't think all American women fake it at all. But I also think there's nothing more helpful to a guy than help him and guide him to be a better lover instead of faking it. We are not stupid. Just like women are not stupid and know what we want, th- we know also we can do a better job. And, and, and that's where I think we need the help of women to tell us to. Kindly, not mean. But French women will give no breaks. <laughs> no break whatsoever. I do like that. I do like that. That it's just like you. You just know. You know, Frank. No, isn't it true? I mean, you know, and then you feel comfortable because yeah. if things go on nicely, you're making love and all this. Ooh la la. Okay, you feel welcome and you feel you've done a good job. Here, sometimes, isn't it true that because of what I've heard so many times about this faking, you don't know. No. And I think it's like the initial sting of being told, like a French woman saying, "Like, oh, we're stopping." The initial sting, with, but in the long run, you're like, all right, I, I know where I stand, which Ex- is great. Exactly. And, and you know, I've learned how to make love with, um, with French women and when I started to make love at a young age. So, <laughs> Wait. Oh, Simon, I'll look yeah. at you. All yeah. right. Yeah. So, but it was, it, was, it was a school of, you know, here's what you should do and not in this. And anyway, and you learn little by little. You do the best you can no matter what. But I really think that's why no lying, no cheating should be the policy for all. 
Because right, we all have the right to be to, to be what we are. Just we don't have to pretend anymore. No, I my I have such a low tolerance for any of the kind of games that continue to go on. Uh, where, how often do you call somebody? Do you call somebody? Do you text somebody? What does that mean? Do you you know uh, are you passive aggressive with somebody? Like why why do so we you know, why continue to play games? The language of love. There's only one, and and that's my advice. If if I like a woman, I'm gonna call her directly and say I would like to take you out. All right, we say yes or no. If I don't know, it's the first text. They say hi, how are you, and all this. The next day, I say I would like to meet you for coffee. I think the biggest mistake, and we're afraid of rejection. I was afraid of rejection in my twenties. Now I'm, I'm a bit older, so I don't. You know, it's not the same fear. But you, everybody can say yes or no. Just ask them out. It's guys who are making the mistake with the, the the phone thing because it's easy to text and text and text instead of. I want to go. I want to want to go out for a drink, a dinner, or something. You know, that's the only way, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And but I also feel like a one way technology has helped in terms of online dating. Also, I feel like technology has made it just so much easier for somebody to just disappear on somebody, like ghosting on somebody. Yes, there you go. So let me ask you this: What do you think is worse? If you have to break up with somebody, what is your recommendation on how to break up with a girlfriend? You've been with somebody for a year or six months. What is the right way for you, Frank? To break up with the person, the right I, the right way is to do it in person. The, certainly, the easy way, the face to face, face to face. I think that's the right way. I think you owe that person. I mean, you've spent some amount of time yeah. with them, and you I owe them just the the respect to be able to resolve it face to face. So I counter argument this because okay. of of experiences of of women who've been through violence and drama. I do not advise any more this. I think really? that there's too much drama. They some jealousy, violence. Instead of a good phone call, where you can always meet after, but I do not think, and, and really to protect the younger women, women should be expecting that last face to face, because I know men can be sometimes sadly some violence, or sometimes women can be violent too, and so there is nothing good that comes up from that face to face conversation. A phone call, live, allows the emotions, and then you can meet later, a week later, if you want to have a follow up. I like that, but. I've really heard callers who has been punched, who has been, you know, because they wanted to do this face to face. So that's my only reserve. No, I I completely understand. It's, Sadly, it's, it yeah, that, that I it's one of those things where I never thought about like, man, I just because you only think that so selfishly just from your own perspective. Like I wouldn't hit somebody, so you think that that's just the universal truth. But it's like, no, there are people that would. Men and women. Yeah. Now, now, let me ask you. Let's go back to Erica and you for a second. Let's talk romance. Oh, I love romance. Okay, romance. Love- How many years you've been with her? Oh, uh, uh, six, sixteen. What's yeah. the most romantic thing or experience mm-hmm. you've had in sixteen years with her? The most romantic. The most romantic. Give us some love, man. Oh, uh, um, you know, it's uh, those are the things that those kind of questions that as you look, you're like, wow, wow, am I really romantic? Maybe I could be more romantic. I. How did you propose? Oh, we're not married. Oh, you, so you spare yourself. Okay. <laughs> so, there you go. So, see, already one foot. I already. I, 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 I see. There you go. Not a special date. Not a special something. Not a, a special Valentine's Day. Nothing. Frank, you're gonna have to listen to my show. I know. I uh, look. At, I gotta go to the rendezvous with Simon and Kim. Look at this. I'm gonna give you this tip. All right. For next Valentine's Day. Okay. Celebrate it twice. Cause I've noticed one thing. American men and all of us, we only celebrate that night, the 14th of February, right? Mm-hmm. I say. On the next morning, come up with flowers again, because nobody does. It's the morning after love, right? It's not just the night. And I think Valentine's Day continues the next day and the day after. So let's hope Erika is not watching this. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> That's right. The next day after Valentine's Day, come up with a great note, a great gift, a bouquet of flower. So she'll have two, and she'll be the only one of her girlfriends ever to have received <laughs> two Valentine's Day celebration. So, how confident do you feel in terms of in, in dating? Or if you're dating or you're in a relationship? So, I'm single now. Yes. How confident? Yes. 100%. Man. You okay. know why? Because I accept the fact of the no. Because I am not afraid of rejection. Because, you know, let's say I have 40 years left to live. I'm 48. And those years to come are the best ones and the last ones. It, 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 nothing is wrong if you politely ask somebody out. So I have, I have, and that's from my mom, confidence. If you are super loved by your mom, you're unstoppable. I, she would say that. I don't know. It sounds arrogant maybe to say that, but I am not afraid of rejection. I, I've been rejected a million times. It, it's okay. You know, i tell you a story. 
uh, what was that? In the supermarket, I think it was a week ago. A week ago, you know, I, and, and I found a wonderful woman. I, you, one of the, I said to her, I said, oh, you're one of the most elegant, charming women I've seen in a long time. What is your name? She says her name. I said, I have only one question. She goes, what is it? I said, are you single? She goes, I'm not. And I said, say no more. And I just, you know, wanted to say, you know, it was nice meeting you. And that's it, right? Maybe something could have happened. Maybe not. It's okay. I think that if you do not dare, you do not live. That's the strategy. So that's why I'm not afraid. I'm more uh-huh. afraid of ending my life than being rejected. I love that because it's one of those things where you're just like, oh, yeah, you can meet people in supermarkets. You can meet people anywhere. That's Is where it, I meet people. Then, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you work at night like I do, people are doing days, the working hours is 9 to 5, you know, and I'm not at work 9 to 5. And I go, you know, we do the rendezvous every night and we start, you know, we, we do the show 10 to midnight or 11 to 1, depends which market, but we prep four hours before. So I'm really working from, let's say, 6 to midnight. So in the times that you've been dating, yes. what has been more of the successful date? People that you found kind of on your own as you're going out in life and you're just approaching people, people that have been set, you've spent, friends that have maybe set you up with somebody, or if you've used some sort of online dating, has no, there been either one that's been more successful? No rules. It's the miracle, it happens rarely, of m- meeting the right person and you feel it in here, in your heart. It's the only mechanism that works. The how and the where is secondary to me. I look at somebody, she looks at me, either a soul click, a heart click, f- enough to start talking, or maybe one of the two is, is you know, not available, but that's really the magic formula. All you gotta do, I always say, look at the person in the eyes for more than three, five seconds. If you feel good here and the attraction is born, if not, the match of love is not started and you move on. I think it's easy, one thing, to maybe start the match of love, but the one thing, like any fire, to be able to sustain that fire, to stoke it, to keep it going so that it can go, 15, you now, know, 5, 10, 15 years. That's where the work starts, yes. right? And that, and that is a matter of how happy you are, right? So I would always say after 18 months, the infatuation is gone. Maximum three years. That's the rule. It's the stats. 18 months later, you're not sexually infatuated by your partner. The love, the true love carries you over. And anybody who rushes after six months, you know, I've got... Friends of mine, guys, oh my God, I met this person. It's so much the love. I said, it's lust. True love starts after 18 months. Even better, three years. And my parents said, they live together two years before they get married. And that was in the 60s. And they said, because you do not know somebody until you've done twice the winter together. <laughs> twice the summer. It's true, right? You've been That's in Chicago. True. Yes. Not the same. So the work is the desire to continue with your true love. But it's hard work. Very hard work. I guess you, I feel like I have two minds of that. One, if you're in the right relationship, should that work feel effortless or no? Depending, no matter how how well connected you guys are, it's still maintaining a relationship is still hard work. It is, it is, and um, what saves relationship is communication. And another thing, forgiveness. People said all the time they call at night the rendezvous, you know, with Simon and Kim. They call us and said he did this to me. And Kim, who's such a realist and, and very Americanized as a, from, from Boise, Idaho, says, no, you know, don't give him a second chance. I am on the side of second chance. I'm going to tell you why. Because in the Bible or in my heart, I've learned from my parents, if you can't forgive, you do not love. Parents forgive their children. True love. People who are truly in love with each other for the rest of their life will have to say, when one says, I'm so sorry, I forgive you. If you can't say, I forgive you to somebody you love, you don't love them enough to be together forever. Now, does that apply for somebody that may make that same uh, offense against you multiple times? They may be honestly uh, sincere in their uh, being sorry. So, yes and no. There is a group of people who suffer from addiction, and addiction is a disease. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's drug, whether sometimes it's too much sex. They have to work on, on themselves. But the limit is this one. To be able to forgive more than, I would say, forgive one time, don't forgive two times. Okay? So, true forgiveness is a one time mistake. For instance, we've had callers, they have mistresses and lovers for years, and then they get caught. And the person says, How can you do that to me? I've been with you for 20 years, and you cheated on me with that person for 15 years. Why? The answer to the why is something was missing. Unless we know what was missing, we can't help the relationship. So it's not a one-way street. And that's why I said, if it's a guy who's acting like a dog with plenty of girls all the time, 
There's no second chance. But if your husband or wife, your partner has cheated on you for years with the same person, something was missing at home. Think about it. Go to a couple therapy and don't give up. I mean, true love, it's a one time. One time. Not twice. One time. True love's one time? I think so. Really? So uh, In lifetime. My goodness. So, so yeah. if something unfortunate were to happen, that, that person passes away or taken away from you there. So that, it's you a different, like different love. That, uh, it, so that's second that, love. Mm. It's a second kind. And sometimes, by the way, a divorce can be fabulous because it's a great rebound. I mean, there's people happier after, on the second marriage than first. And nobody can tell you if this is if your true love or not. Only you can. Right? I, I listen to callers and they say, oh, it's my true love. I don't know. I hope so. Only you can tell. That's why I said, don't listen to family and friends. At the end, that's why Romeo and Juliet was dramatic in a way, but daring. Romeo and Juliet went against everybody else because true love was stronger than the politics or the hate. I like that. And when people say, oh, listen to your best friends, listen. No, they're not in your skin. You have to decide. But I feel like, isn't that, that's tough with true love. And also to, because it could fall in that time frame, like say Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. That falls within that time of like infatuation or lust. I mean, so how do you, can you judge what, what is infatuation and lust and what is really true love? Let's say 18 months to three years later, you mm -hmm. wake up like you did. Uh, it's morning. The person has crazy hair, bad breath, looks really, you know, not so good. And you look at her and said, you laugh and you say, I love this person. And that morning, you know you have true love. N because there's no more sex. There's no more makeup. There is, there is just us human beings being our awkward selves. And when that happens, you can thank God for that. It's a miracle. Now, what happens? You wake up one morning, uh, five years after that or something like that, and you don't have that feeling. Does that an indication like, uh-oh, maybe this is it, not... It can happen because... it. it Love is like a match of fire. So the, the fire starts, burn very strong. But the fire doesn't burn and burns forever if you don't add wood, if you don't feed the fire. It's really, that's why the, the mythology, love and fire are the same. Did you feel like that when you're infatuated, when you start, you feel consumed by the relationship? You've heard that, friends, <laughs> right? I'm consumed by this woman. But if you don't feed by kindness, attention, by forgiveness, by laugh, by talk conversation by be able to brush out all our shenanigans the fire of love goes back to fog to, to smoke excuse me and then to cold and disappears even if it was true love you got to take care of your true love because it's a one time thing it's not we open the light and it's on forever it's not a Duracell battery you have to feed true love and for that you have to take care my mom said they've been together for 50 years my parents they said, all I do is that when I look at your father, Robert, I say, I look at him and I say, if I were him, what would I want from me today? That's all. And my father said to me, do never take a woman for granted. You have to charm her, charm her again, charm her always. The day you stop charming her, she will think of something else. He said, that's the biggest mistake. This is not buying a car. This is not, no. It's a woman, the most precious, unique human beings on earth they give birth we don't and no. so that makes women so more complicated than we are and so my parents have shown me that that's uh you that know, is remarkable. something to think about definitely yeah uh as we're talking about relationships and going 50 years hopefully everybody's fortunate enough to find that kind of love they can sustain that long uh, length of time yes but i feel like there are all the people that are also running the the problem of being in a relationship too long they feel like i should have i should have left much sooner than this and it, yeah. i'm just stuck and we, I mean, we can just see cycles repeating, things like that. How hard is it to, to leave a relationship? Do you feel people stay in relationships way longer than they should? It's the hardest thing until you're out because you, 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 you go back to your biggest fear. Who's going to want me? Uh, the guilt. And also because society doesn't give break against that. I really feel we have to welcome divorce and separation as much as we welcome marriage and getting together. We have the right to start a relationship. We all have the right to end a relationship on our own. If you have children, they come first. If you're just together, do what's good for you. You have one life. That's why I said I have 40 years left to live, Robbie, if God's willing. That's not so many years. And summers count double. So. <laughs> now, you say uh, children come first. In terms of relationship, do you think it's better to split up and uh, for the good of the children like so that they see you both in healthier happier relationships so i i think that you don't want to give up easily but it's better for children to see amicable parents than hateful parents don't teach your kids how to hate 
if you show your kids how to hate each other, they're going to hate their future girlfriend and wives. Show them how to love each other. And if you can't love your husband or wife anymore, separate. And show them you can be amicable, respectful, and friendly. Because your children become adult, and that's how the drama starts. Children are sponges on our behaviors. You know that, Frank. You know, mm -hmm. have my girl, have children I love. We are the example for them of how we love, hate, fight, forgive, talk, laugh, and get older. We are responsible for our children's behavior later. So that's a key in life. Don't give up on them. Man. Be courageous. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting deep now. No, that's I what I love. It. How, that's you, a great. You got me into a complete different. No, nah, that's what you I love. You got wanted. me. You're yes. good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you, you, got, you got that. You got me. So now, as we start wrapping stuff up here, I, yeah. I can sit here and talk to you. Uh, I have a bazillion questions uh, that I would love to talk to you about. But uh, what is going forward? I mean, you've got the radio show, The Rendezvous with Simon and Kim. You're over 20, 20 stations all well, around the country yeah. right now. Yeah, yes. So now, uh, what are your plans going forward with The Rendezvous? What do so you, what are your I goals? want you to do a prayer for me. All right. Okay. I am pitching my own TV show to major networks as we speak. And I'm going to New York next week to pitch two major networks. I need fingers crossed to, to, to reality, relationship-based show. I can't send no more because I'm superstitious. If that happens, the American dream from your humble servant here is completed, which is radio show at night and having a morning TV show for women in the morning. So that's what I'm working on. Um, it came up from a personal relationship that went south in my life, and I came up with a conclusion, and from then on, I came up with a TV show. Uh, but you know, TV is hard. TV and and even harder when you have an accent and and like mine. So uh, that's what I'm working on. And also, our heart media, and that's then me and Kim for the radio show. We are um, preparing to have more stations with uh, our heart media and others, and make the show more interactive, more social media based, and laugh more. Because I said to Kim all the time, what better job than being radio talk show host? listen to love stories, life in general, and be paid for it. I mean, it's a miracle. And I'm grateful to have such a job. So that's what I'm working on. And there is a book that I'm working on, which is The Adventure, but I only fin uh, publish it if I get the TV uh, show, which is how you know, a French dude arrives in Ohio and could end up where I'm at. And, and, and I think the title will be Only in America. Oh, I mean, even uh, fingers crossed that the TV show does Thank work. Thank you. I need, yes. a, I need a lot of mazzle and, and luck, yes. Fingers but crossed. I still think, even if that doesn't happen, ending the book by meeting me. Uh, you know what? Yes. Then that... Frank. <laughs> give me give me a show. There you go. That's you know? right. What a great ending for that story. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Maybe that's the end of the book. That's right. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not ooh la la. Ay, ay, ay. No, ay, ay. Oh, all right. Yeah. So don't say that in bed with the lady. Yeah. <laughs> That would not be going well. Uh, no, no. Aye, aye, aye. No. Get out. That's why I appreciate a French woman's uh, directness at that moment. Yeah, no, they stop, stop it. right there. Go. Yeah. Back to the doghouse. <laughs> Is that all? I remember that. Is that, that all? That's it. Forget about it. <laughs> so, Simon, if they want to follow you, uh, you either the rendezvous uh, with Simon and Kim or on it, social really, media. Social media, we, we have uh, uh, really Instagram, Simon Marcel Badinter. Maybe you can say it better than me. Simon S I M O N Marcel M A R C E L Badinter B A D I N T E R Instagram and the show Simon and Kim <laughs> I can't speak English <laughs> Simon and Kim dot com and the rendezvous Facebook the rendezvous with Simon and Kim me on the rendezvous Simon Marcel and so on Oh <laughs> my goodness look at this uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to me you too, Simon Frank. thank you so you much know, you, you're one of a kind oh, you and goodness. Erica <laughs> we're gonna do it you know yes. So, folks, play, follow so, uh, Simon on social media. Follow uh, the rendezvous with Simon and Kim. I mean, in 20 cities right now and only growing. And growing. Keep your fingers crossed Next there. Next week. For the, yes. He's going to New York. Let's yes. get him a TV show, everybody. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, check out all the other great AfterBuzz programming on AfterBuzz TV. The, for this episode of AfterBuzz Spotlight, I've been your host, Frank Moran. You can follow me on Twitter at HappyGoJackie, and I'll see you next time. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 